The last few times I've spoken, the focus passages have been from the Gospel of John. At Christmas, we looked at chapter 1, where we were reminded who uh, baby Jesus really was as we celebrated his birth. Uh, as John would put it, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, John goes on to say later in that chapter, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we would begin then to see how the Word Jesus, fully man, fully God, would dwell among us as we looked at chapters 2 and 3 where we saw Jesus perform his first miracle at the wedding in Cana of Galilee where he turned water into wine. And then we would see him in chapter 3 in deep conversation with Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin, a leader of the Jews, and Jesus would tell him, who you are is not enough. To enter the kingdom of heaven. Your position, your wealth, your connections within the community cannot get you into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, you must be born again. Romans 10, and, and, and if you want to understand what that means, Romans 10 uh, verse 9 says it, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him up from the dead, you will be saved. We would also learn that salvation was not just available to a select few, but it was available to everyone. John 3, verse 16, we all know it. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever or whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Today, we move on to John chapter 4, and we will look at the topic, the well, the word, and our worship. The well, the word, and our worship. Chapter 4 begins this way. It says, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had, now listen to this, friends, now he had to go through Samaria. Underscore the had. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Friends, Jesus started his ministry and he was being noticed. People were following him. People were getting baptized because of his teachings. And the Pharisees were also taking note. So to cool down the temperature a bit, because he did not yet want to pre present himself, um, he decided to go back north to Galilee. But instead of going around Samaria, uh, the Bible tells us that they traveled through Samaria. And actually, if you read it in the King James Version, it says, and he must needs go through Samaria. You see, this is significant because whenever a Jew was traveling um, from Judea to Galilee and vice versa, they avoided Samaria like the plague. They would not travel through Samaria because, as verse 9 says, uh, Jews did not associate with Samaritans. And we'll read that later. They had no dealings with them. None. Zero. Nada. You see, this all started when the Assyrians defeated the northern kingdom of Israel. And they deported many Israels, Israelites from the land. But some were left. They would, the Assyrians would also settle conquered peoples there. Who brought their worship and their various false gods, and they would intermarry with the Israelites who remained. So the Jews, because of the, 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 the worshiping of false gods, because of the false teachings that were going on, they now despised those who were called Samaritans. But the Bible tells us that Jesus had to go through Samaria. And I can imagine his disciples were, you know, were thinking, 
Why? What are you doing? But friends, isn't this just like Jesus? Uh, this is why when we read in the parable the, uh, uh, the, of the Good Samaritan, it really shook those of who were listening because in that day, the adjective good could never be used to describe a Samaritan. But then, there is Jesus. He came to seek and to save those who were lost. It didn't matter who you were. It didn't matter who your ancestors were. It didn't matter your status in life. He came for the whosoever. So, John 4, verse 5 and 6 tells us he came to a town called Sychar. And he was tired from the journey and he sat down at the well. I, I thought it was significant, friends, because here is the bread of life sent from heaven, sent down from glory, sitting down at what is for civilization back then, a wellspring of life. You see, friends, when we look at the story, we have to understand the significance of the well. And that's our first point, the significance of the well. The villages and towns during that time were built around wells and other water sources or sources of water to ensure that life could go on. Water, of course, was used for irrigation when crops were planted. It was used for watering livestock. Water helped to maintain the balance of the ecosystem. It was necessary also for personal hygiene, just like it is today. We also are made up of 60% of water, and without water, our bodies, our bodies would, our bodies would, would, would not be able to regulate temperature, transport nutrients and oxygen, flush out waste, and lubricate joints. Whenever a well was found, people could settle, and villages and towns would spring up. If the water swords dry, dried up, the people were forced to migrate to other locations where there was, water, where there was a water source. It is said that we can survive one to two months without food if we have adequate water. But without water, we can only survive three to five days. The fact is water is highly important for our surroundings and also for our bodies. Without water, society would not survive and individually we would not survive. Uh, so one of the reasons the, the, the well is significant is we need what it can provide. We need what the well can provide. Uh, we need the water it carries. And so if we need the water in the well, we also need the original source of the water. And when we drill down to find that original source, we will only come to the conclusion that we need God because God is the creator. He has created the water source for all of us. And that means, uh, that is, and, and the means by which that water source continuously replenishes. Friends, we need God. Day in and day out, we need him. The, 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 the song said, we need him every hour. Every hour, every moment, every day. And as much as we try to limit him, his presence and power is evident all around us. The psalm says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament, firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. If we look hard enough, friends, we will see God in everything around us. So the well reminds us that we have a God who is able to provide for all our needs according to his riches and glory. But as we move on, we see something else from the well. Verse 7, and, verse 7 to 9 says, when, the, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? 
for his disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. But even with that, what we find is the well was a place where anyone could come. It was common ground. Jesus was there as well as a Samaritan woman. Both came to the place so that they could revive the, their, so the, their weary bodies. The place where you could drink to rehydrate your body, to quench your thirst. It is, this is a moment that reminds us, friends, that Jesus, though fully God, was also fully man because his body has the same needs just as the rest of us. The need for water, the need for nutrition, the need for rest, among other things. So both Jesus and the Samaritan woman were at the well. Both Jews and Samaritans revered Jacob, so his well stood as a strong signal in both cultures. Again, it didn't matter who you were or where you came from. The well was open to all, and all had the opportunity to draw from the place that provided water from all for all. The place that reminds us of the creative power of God and the sustaining power of God. W what was different about this encounter between Jesus and this woman was it was noon. And women as part of their responsibilities of that day, and let me, let me repeat, as part of their responsibilities of that day, they would draw water either early in the day or later in the day to try to, 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 to escape the heat of the sun, the midday sun. So not at noon where the sun was the hottest. So this was a very strange time when you look at it on the surface. But when we drill down, you see the conversation later in the chapter between this woman and Jesus. And we find out that she had five husbands. And the one she's currently living with is not her husband. So we can conclude that her environment may not be a happy one. And, the peop and people may be talking about her behind her back. And maybe some have the courage to talk to her directly to her face. And so to avoid the contention, she chooses this time to draw her water. Friends, many have looked down on this woman because of her situation. Many say that she has a questionable character. But I think it's also possible for another reason because she could maybe be disappointed by five men. And let me explain. Let me explain. If you remember, if you know your Bible, if you know Deuteronomy, it tells us that only men could divorce women. But it is, it is sort of vague. So it's very possible that they found some vague reason, each of them, to hurt her, to, 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 to push her aside and move on. I don't know. I'm just saying, when we, when we study the Bible, we have to understand context and culture. And so this is a possibility that you have a woman here who is hurting because she has been rejected by five men. And now she's in a situation because the current man is not her husband. You see, she's probably, regardless of whatever is going on, whatever the reason, the current situation is she wants to avoid people. She wants to avoid the chatter. So she comes to the well at noon. She may be despondent, discouraged, going through the motions. But on this day, Jesus is there, waiting for her. You see, friends, 
when we find ourselves down and out, when we find ourselves at our lowest point, God provides the word to inject power into our lives. The word will bring power of restoration into our lives. And that is the next point. There's a song that says, you called out my name. Knew my past, you covered my shame. This amazing grace you shown me so patiently. And you waited just for me, just for me. Friends, that is who Jesus is to everyone who will come to know him as Lord and Savior. This woman was just getting to know Jesus, but what I'm saying is even in your getting to know, even in your first introduction, uh, it's, Jesus is the one who's waiting for us. He's the one concerned about the whosoever. You see, when, the, when we read that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, we have to come to the realization that the Word came for you, the Word came for me, uh, you know, the Word came for this woman. Why? Because, because the, the Bible reminds us, uh, all we like sheep have gone astray, uh, and we have all turned everyone for, uh, in his own way. But even with that, friends, even though we have went our own way, even though we were condemned to death, the Bible reminds us, I'm going to say it again, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have ever eternal life. Verse 17 says, for God did not send his, his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. You see, when we read verse 7 of chapter 4, verse 7 of chapter 4, it, um, we see that Jesus is thirsty. And yes, he's physically thirsty because of the journey. But could it be that his spirit was also thirsty? Not for water, but for relationship. You see, this is why he waited for this woman. Because he wanted to, her to understand who he was and the power of restoration that she could experience in her life. Friends, it may not seem possible uh, to you, but the power, but Jesus has the power to restore your life from the shambles it may be in. See, once you connect... Once you are connected to him, you will have the, the power of God working on your behalf. The power, the power of God um, working on your behalf. Moving mountains and making ways where you did not see a way. You see, all he has to do is just say the word. Just as he did with Lazarus. He didn't say, he didn't touch him. All he says was, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out. Just as he did with Jairus' daughter. Where he said, Talitha Kumai, or translated, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Isaiah 55 verse 10 and 11 says, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth. And making it bud and flourish. So that it yields seed for the sower and bread for, and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It, shall, it will not return to me empty. Other, other versions say it will not return to me void. But it will accomplish what I desire. And achieve the purpose for which I sent it. At the moment that Adam and Eve fell to sin, God started the plan. The plan that has Jesus waiting for you and waiting for me. 
the plan that would take generations and generations to come to pass from Abraham right down through Mary and Joseph. But God's plan was never to leave us or forsake us. God's plan, God, God always had a plan for everyone, not just the Jews, but for all in the earth. Jesus waited for this woman to arrive just for her. The journey to Sychar was all about her. You see, she is the whosoever we read about in John 3.16 just like each of us is. And just like her, if we believe in him, we will experience the power of restoration in our lives as he restores our relationship with God the Father. But as the relationship is restored, the, world, the word also illuminates the truth about ourselves. When we continue to read in, in John, John, John 4, verse 10 through through 18 it says Jesus answered her if you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink you would have asked him and he would have given you living water sir the woman said you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep where can you get this living water are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I won't go thirsty and I won't have to keep coming to draw water. I'm going to stop here for a second. Because what this conversation shows is how relationship is built. Jesus first asked the woman for water so he could drink. He first showed her that he would trust her to give him water. And then he goes on to talk about this living water. Here's what I think happens. She was tired of her life. She was tired of the pain. She was tired of the, the, the noise that was around her. She finally realized that it was time for her to ask for something. It was, she, she finally realized that she may be dehydrated. Her spirit may be dehydrated. That's happened to many of us. We've cut ourselves off from the source that restores our soul. And we become spiritually thirsty. And so we, we no longer have the strength to withstand the wiles of the devil. We no longer have the strength to, 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 to withstand the storms, even though Jesus is with us. Because we are spiritually thirsty. So she says to him, give me this water so I won't get thirsty again. She finally admitted she needed a change. And he told her, verse 8, 16 says, go call your husband and come back. Verse 17 says, she says, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. The word will illuminate the truth in your life. When you read the word, when you study the word, when you look for God's truth, it will show you who you are. And it may hurt for a second, but it will also show you who you can be. 
It will also show you who you can become with the help of God. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. God wants nothing but good for us. So the truth, so the word gives us the power to restore. The word also gives us the truth about ourselves and the truth about our situation and the truth about who we can be. But he doesn't stop there. The, the conversation doesn't stop there. The conversation goes on um, to talk about worship. And this is something that I didn't get before, but I see it really clearly now. Your worship is personal. Our pers worship is personal. Verse 19 says, sir, uh, the woman says, sir, I can see your prophet. So the truth stung her. The truth about her situation stung her. So she tries to change, change the, the conversation. I can see your prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place we must worship, uh, the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. I'm not quite sure where she was going with that. Could it be that because the truth came out now, she now thought about where she needed to worship, where she needed to atone for her sins, how she needed to re reconnect with God. Verse 21 says, Woman, a, a woman, Jesus replies, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and now, and now, and has come now, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. I don't know if you see what I see here. Salvation is open to everyone. It says, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Salvation is open to everyone. Praise is open to everyone. We sang the song earlier, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. But look at this, what, what Jesus says about worship. A time is coming and has come now when true worshipers, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Verse 24 says, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. So could it be that praise is open to anyone, but we need to have a certain connection. We need to have that connection, spirit to spirit, where we can worship, truly worship God. I'm not saying we can't praise Him, but the worship, the worship where God can talk to you directly. You don't need to hear the music. You don't need to hear anything. But God is telling you and saying, "See what I've done for you before. I will." Do it again, and I'll do it again, and I'll do it again. See, when you worship God in spirit, you understand that, 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 that in all your ways you acknowledge him. Because when you acknowledge him in all your ways, you realize how much he's been working for you. Your spirit realizes how much he's been working for you, and your spirit even when your spirit can't express it, your spirit's connection to God says, God bless you. 
Thank you for all that you have done. Thank you for sustaining me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for providing for me. Your spirit will talk on your behalf. Sometimes we get caught up in the places of worship, where we worship, and how we worship. What Jesus is saying is that time is, is over. It's over. Because those who worship, truly worship, worship on a spirit level where you're connected to God, acknowledging everything that he has done, acknowledge that he's the source of your strength, acknowledging that he's the strength of your life, acknowledging everything that God does for you. God is spirit. And them, those who worship him, must, not may, must worship him in spirit and in truth. See, and when you truly, truly worship God, you will understand that no matter what your situation is, he can turn it around. He can turn it around. He can turn it around. Verse 25, the woman says, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. This is where I wish I was this woman. Because if you think about it, this is an honor that we're about to hear. Verse 26 says, then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? You're waiting for the Messiah. You know the Messiah, when the Messiah comes, things will change. You know, you know that, 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 that what has crippled you, what has hurt you, what has devastated your life. You know that the Messiah has the power to change all of that. And you're talking and you're talking. And you realize at the end of your conversation that this person who you're speaking to is the Messiah, is the one with the power, is the one with the strength, is the one who can provide, is the one who can protect. He is the Messiah. When you truly worship God, God he will, re will reveal himself to you and show up in your circumstance. But I would be, a, um, but yeah, I need to add this part. It says then Jesus, that, 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 it says, just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. So, so understand this. Understand that, 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 that Jesus was all about coming to seek and to save those who were lost. He was not about tradition. He was not about religion. He was not about going with the flow. Jesus was about seeking those he came to save. The disciples return and they're surprised because, first of all, he's called a rabbi. Rabbis were forbidden to talk to a Samaritan woman. Not just a Samaritan, forbidden to talk to a single woman by themselves. 
It shouldn't happen. But Jesus came to turn this world upside down, crossway. But so, so the disciples are, are, are puzzled. They're, see, they're seeing something they've never seen before. And, and you, you must understand that Jesus sending them off into town was part of the plan. Because he did not want any interruption as he's talking to this woman. That's who our Jesus is, friends. But at the end of the day, they wanted to ask why they were, why Jesus was talking to her. But they didn't ask. Verse 28 says, Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, Come see a man who revealed the truth about my life, who revealed who I am, who I was, or gave me hope for who I could be. Amen. Could this not be the Messiah? And they came out of the town and made their way towards him. And further down, verse 39 says, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Friends, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. They believed in him because of the woman's testimony. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days because of his words. And because of his words, many more became believers. Verse 42, John 4, verse 42, it says, They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man is the Savior, is really the Savior of the world. Friends, I don't know who this word was for today. Many of us have gone through struggles. Many of us has got, have gone through dif difficulties. But many of us can attest to the power of God. Amen. Many of us. Many of us can attest to God's goodness. Even in our difficulties. Because we know that with Jesus in the vessel, we can smile at the storm. So many of us have seen it for ourselves. So many of us have testified it for ourselves. I mean, we've, we've, we have people in here, when you hear their testimony, you understand that there must be a God. That there must be a Jesus. As we close, I want to encourage you, if you don't have that connection with Jesus, if your praise is all you do, and you're missing the worship, it, let us have a conversation. Let us have a little talk. We want to introduce you to Jesus. We want you to have Jesus for yourself. He's in, he has enough for everyone. There's no limits to who can, be, who can be in relationship with Jesus. Just remember, I remember the song. A song that I've remembered for years. I love that man. From Galilee. As he has done so very much for me. He's taken all my sin.
and let the Holy Ghost come in. I love that man, that man from Galilee. God bless you.